LG G-Flex takes a curved leaf out of the Samsung Galaxy Rounds book, though in a different axis. Here it's like an exaggerated version of the Galaxy Nexus with dramatically curved 6-inch AMOLED screen and, quote, self-healing back cover, eh? Nanotechnology, I'll be bound. It's large, though, bigger than the Note 3 you'll see later in this show, but with the same 2.3 GHz Snapdragon 800 processor, 2 GB of RAM, 32 GB of internal storage, 13 megapixel camera, only Android 4.2, disappointingly, and of course, with Optimus UI on top, plus a 3500 mAh sealed battery. I'd rather have the Note's configuration, to be honest. Just as on the G2, the buttons are on the back. What? I thought this idea hadn't taken off. Motorola couldn't quite bring the much-acclaimed USA Moto X to the world yet, but there's a cheaper, slightly smaller sister device, the waterproof Moto G. A 4.5-inch 720p screen, a relatively low-end 1.2-gig quad-core Snapdragon 400 processor, a modest 5 megapixel rear camera, 720p video recording, only 1 gig of RAM, no LTE. This is all quite modest and clearly aimed at emerging and budget markets. Only 8 or 16 gig of sealed storage too, so probably a showstopper for many viewers. With Google owning Motorola, it's odd to see this launch with Android 4.3 only. 4.4 is a month or two away, apparently. Notable, other than the sub £150-ish price in the UK, are the use of Nokia-style replaceable coloured back covers. And yes, despite these, you still can't get at the battery. Gah! I think I'm a purist at heart. I love good design, simplicity of purpose, and it takes something of a wrench to get my head around gadgets and systems that blur the boundaries and cross divides. It's partly why I've struggled slightly with the Galaxy Note series here, initially branding them as something other than phones while recognising them as super examples of high tech. With the moving of goalposts for the concept of what makes a device a phone, I've covered that in a previous show, i.e. the requirements to fit any pocket and to be used one-handed have been dropped in the light of new uses such as watching movies and browsing desktop class websites. Uh, with this in mind, the Note range is back in use as a phone, helped a little by Samsung slimming the device down as it evolved and with even bigger uh, screen to bezel ratio. But then there's the stylus. Look, I get it. You can scribble notes and produce sketches and crop text and annotate screenshots and drag windows around and have a lot of fun. All in something that's the tech fan's wildest dream spec-wise. But however clever this all is, it's tough to get much real work done that wouldn't be done better on an Ultrabook or even an iPad Air or similar alongside a more traditional phone form factor. After all, you can get plenty of alternative tech for the purchase price of one Galaxy Note 3. But maybe you do just want a smartphone with a nice big screen and not a stylus driven tech tour de force, in which case there's this Mega 6.3 that I reviewed recently with much bigger screen for around half the price. <laughs> so to still get the Note 3, you really, really have to want the stylus and its functions and for more than just fiddling around and showing off to your friends. But the Note 3 hardware itself, it's solid and well built, all plastic, but heavily disguised as stitched leather here on the back and metal around the perimeter. It feels terrific in the hand, albeit just that tiny bit too large to be used one handed a lot of the time. There's Samsung's traditional menu and back controls here, either side of a physical home button, a side screen button here, and a decent 13 megapixel camera on the back, which then peels off to reveal a huge 3200 milliamp hour battery and micro SIM and micro SD bays. Inside there's a 32 gigabyte mass memory, so many users may not even need an expansion card at all. Down at the bottom is this monstrosity of a USB 3 composite jack. Although clever from a backwards compatibility technical point of view, it's aesthetically ugly and is enough to make the world turn all Apple and run towards the far more elegant lightning connector they've uh, invented. So far so good and there are few surprises in the main software loadout. It's almost identical to that in the uh, Galaxy S4 and Mega 6.3 which I reviewed recently. Complete with gimmicks like, are you ready for this? This is the list, I'll go fast. The hovering finger air view, air gesture over the proximity sensor to swipe through content, tilt zooming, eye tracking, smart stay, the auto rotation feature according to the angle of your face, the smart pause when you look away, <laughs> and smart scroll when your eyes reach the bottom of a page. Some of these may prove useful to you, but I'm happy with almost all of them turned off and I'm sure battery life is better as a result. 
When Samsung says the Note 3 is feature packed, it's not kidding. As with the Note 2 before it, the learning curve for a new user to get the most of all its features is steep. I think weeks or even months. Thanks in part to this, the ultimate gimmick, arguably, first in the original Note, the S Pen, an inductive digitizer stylus with a button along it uh, that works in conjunction with a special screen layer to give pressure sensitive pen detection. In addition to dedicated applications of its own, as you'll see, the S Pen even has its own mini UI uh, that pops up when you remove it. Air Command offers Action Memo, which converts your scribblings to usable text for other apps to use. Scrapbooker, which lets you grab any text or graphical content, snipping it into a global scrapbook. All very well, but it's a data silo in that you can only export the content later to another compatible Samsung Galaxy device. The screen right, letting you annotate screenshots, and the novelty pen window system, wherein selected Samsung applications can run in floating windows on top of other content. This last is the most interesting technically, but it's not very practical and pales compared to Samsung's established existing multi-window system, which is enabled out of the box here, and which uses the display real estate far more efficiently, and which is compatible with double the number of applications. I was also disappointed in the lack of sensitivity in the review device. Swiping the stylus from side to side to navigate touch with often didn't work unless I pressed quite hard, at which point I started getting worried I was going to scratch the screen. I don't want to seem too negative about the S Pen and Samsung's extra software goodies. I'm sure artists and advertising execs and kids have fun with it all, but if I'm honest, I can live without any of it in my phone. I got a fair amount of flack for not including the Note 3 in my recent top five in Phone Show 213, but I stand by the omission. The display is decent, but it's the somewhat horrible diamond pentile layout. It's crisp enough at 1080p at five inches on the Galaxy S4, but the fuzziness is starting to be noticeable even to my ancient eyes on a 5.7 inch display. Contrast this to the Note 2's true RGB pixels at 720p on a slightly smaller screen, and the latter's display is superior. Uh, also superior on the Note 2 is the speaker output, with the Note 3 speaker audio being a, a deadened and quietened and duly by the faux leather back, not allowing a direct grill. Instead, sound is bounced out of internal baffles and squeezed out through the phone's bottom edge, all in name of style. A, eh? have a listen. This is maximum volume, so it's quite loud. Yeah, the quality, the, the timbre of the sound is not quite there compared to the Note 2. The kicker? Well, the Note 2 is still available new at around half the price. I repeat, Galaxy Note 2 is half the price of the Note 3, which makes the Note 2 superb value. And the main reason why the Note 3 didn't make it into my top five, I was simply torn and very tempted to stick the 2 in instead. But then I already had two Samsung Galaxies and the 5, so something I had to give. But again, let's not get too negative. The Note 3 is still a fine device if you need all its features. The camera's stunning in all but the dimmest conditions and faster subjects, macros in particular, as on the Galaxy S4, are a speciality. Hopefully you'll enjoy the samples on display here. Just wow. <laughs> there are the usual selection of camera modes, some useful like HDR and some gimmicky. Golf swing mode, anyone? Something for everyone, including a variety of burst mode best shot options. Video capture is 1080p by default, which is sensible, although it can record at 2160p. That's 4K video if you really want to, though quite what you do with 4K video in 2013 is another matter, maybe for the future. Bundled with the Note 3 are a lot of extras, even beyond the Samsung TouchWiz apps. Uh, so S Health, Watch On, S Translator, S Voice, Multi-Window, etc. Even beyond the sensor utilities, air gestures and so on, and beyond the S Pen editions such as Scrapbook, Inside a special Galaxy Plus folder are Autodesk Sketchbook, a pro-level multi-layer art tool that, if you're good enough, unlike me, really unlocks what the digitizer and pen are capable of, albeit limited to creations on a phone 1080p screen. There's also Flipboard, Dropbox, Evernote, Bloomberg and TripAdvisor, plus the Samsung Hub, including music, video, book and game stores, plus Samsung apps. Take all of this together, and that's a lot to take in for the geek and enthusiast, never mind the regular Joe in the street. The Note 3 isn't a buy it and try it for a bit and change your mind after a week device. It's something you'll need to invest time in.
And even assuming you're happy with this investment, do take a look at the Note 2 first at half the price point. It's got 98% of the functionality and the hardware is even better in some ways, as mentioned. In the meantime, though, this is kind of Samsung's flagship at the moment, uh, the Galaxy Note 3. We'll have gathered from a couple of shows ago that in addition to virtual pints of beer from you guys, ProPorter are helping keep the lights on too at the phone show, to which extent I'm running through some of my absolute favourite products of theirs. And number one has to be the turbocharger range, which I've raved about off and on in phone show chat for years. Yes, they do the big chargers. Here's the uh, 7,000 milliamp power one, which I swear by on trips. And yes, you can probably get the equivalent cheaper from Amazon sellers, but I bet they don't give you the same personal customer service and lifetime warranty. Anyway, completely unique is this, the tiny and inexpensive pocket power. I can't recommend this highly enough. The aim isn't to completely recharge your phone. How could it? This thing's credit card sized. Unlike with the bigger chargers, which many of us can't be bothered to carry everywhere, the aim here is to provide an emergency charge of up to 750 milliamp hours, enough to get me connected and home at the end of a long day. Once charged, it keeps this for about uh, three to four weeks. This was charged, um, I kid you not, this was charged two months ago. It's still showing three LEDs, although I suspect it's probably down to about 70-80%. Um, so I leave it in my wallet with my other credit cards and debit cards ready for action. So you're in need of power, or in my case, usually a member of my family needing power. Ahem. Whip out the pocket power from my wallet, unfold the little micro USB lead and press the LED button on top. Bingo, charging away. Once home, it charges in 30 minutes or so from any USB source ready for the next time. Just remember to put it back in your wallet.